Beautiful work, Robin. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome to church today. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our, our services today. If, if you don't know, today we're starting 50 Days of Transformation. Hopefully you brought your, um, your transformed book. If you didn't, we can hopefully get you one of those if you're a part of our small group. If today is your first day here and um, you have never filled out one of these contact cards, they are in front of you in your pew. If you want to grab one and fill one of those out, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, here at our church, and we'd love to find out some more um, information, but to also give you some information about who we are at LUMC Ministries. So if you have never filled one of these out, would you take one of those, fill that out, and you can put it in the offering plate um, this morning after service is over. A couple things that we want to bring to your attention is that I had mentioned already the transformed book. If you are participating in a transformed small group, those officially start today. Uh, our Sunday school classes will be officially starting those today. Our um, groups will be starting today. And so we're so glad that we get to be a part of those. If you really wanted to be a part of a transformed group and you weren't able to get signed up, we'd still love to plug you into one. And so please don't feel like you don't have the opportunity to be a part of one if you didn't sign up already. We, we want to get you plugged into one. And so there are some all throughout the week, even all the way to Saturday this coming week, if you weren't able to get get to somewhere this week and we'd love to get you to be a part of that and so if you would come and see myself pastor chris um, after the service we'd love to figure out a, a group that you could get connected to today um, with that being said your devotions for your transform book are going to be starting tomorrow morning so you'll be starting that tomorrow today there's a place in there where you can take notes and keep track of everything that Pastor Chris is saying today all the golden nuggets that he'll share with us today, so you'll be able to have that with you, and you'll want to bring that with you each Sunday to church over the next seven weeks. Two things we want to bring your attention to. This coming Saturday is our fall festival. We're excited about this. This is our hayride. Um, all the food that um, we'll be providing as far as hot dogs and s'mores will be there. Uh, we're asking that people would, would bring along some kind of snack to share if they would like. Um, I'll be providing sticks and that for, for roasting hot dogs and marshmallows, but if you would bring a chair, that would be amazing. It's going to be a great time this coming Saturday. It starts at 3, but you can come anytime, and we'll, we'll have an awesome time together. Secondly, right after our 12 o'clock, or at 12 o'clock today, right after our 11 o'clock service, we're doing another family conversation. What this is is an opportunity for our church to come together and to just converse about what LUMC Ministries is, who we are, what we're doing, uh, talk about some great things that are going on here at LUMC Ministries, and then give our church the opportunity just to ask Pastor Chris some questions and say, hey, I don't understand this, I don't get this, could you uh, clarify this, any kind of questions, concerns, issues, whatever, we'll be talking about those today, and we're having pie, so that's exciting, and that will be taking place around 1215 downstairs in Dixon Hall after our 11 o'clock service. <clears throat> I want to bring one more thing to your attention. Pastor Chris has no idea that I'm going to be saying this. Did you know that we are a year from the first time that he actually met us? He started in July, but we were closed because of COVID, and we didn't start till the 1st of October. This is really only a year that you have been doing church with us on Sunday mornings. Did you know that October is Pastor Appreciation Month? Come up here for a second. How many of you a year ago had any idea what our mission was here at LUMC Ministries? In one year, this man has really transformed what we do here at LUMC Ministries. He has really brought us to a place that's caused us to say, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing, and we're all on the same page. I can't tell you how much this man has meant to me in a year that he's been a part of this church and the things that I've seen happen here at LUMC Ministries in the 10 years that I've been here that we've never been able to accomplish in a year. This, this, this man has been an awesome, an awesome part of what we have been doing here at LUMC Ministries. And I, I would just appreciate it if you would appreciate him today. If you would just, and he, has no, he did not tell me to do this, except for the $20 he gave me before we started. Just 
just show Pastor Chris your appreciation this morning. Let him know how great of a job he's doing. It's, it's a pleasure to do ministry with this man. So, so give him a round of applause this morning. Let's pray. Lord, there are certain things that happen in our lives that we look back on and say, wow, what a, what a great thing that was. And, and as horrible of a thing as it was when Pastor Tom died, as an awful series of um, months that we had to go through, not knowing what was going to happen, God, we're, we're so grateful for the, for the man that you've brought to us. Thank you for Chris and Carla and all the things, God, that you have worked out in their lives. Thank you for um, just bringing us back to what our purpose is here at LUMC. Thank you for causing us to um, have to go through pain and, and struggle so that we could um, just understand, God, your presence in our lives and know that you wanted to do bigger and better things. Lord, we're amazed at what you do. You are an awesome God. You are so worthy of praise and glory, and, and we want to offer you that. Thank you so much today for um, just allowing us to come together to worship. Would you inhabit the praises of your people this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up together and let's give them some praise. Would you join me this morning in our call to worship? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord, give your strength, and the sound of With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. And the peoples.
heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's humble land, a higher plane than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I'm on to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, let my feet on higher ground. I want to scale utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright but still I'll pray till heaven I've found Lord lead me on to higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher Let's pray. Lord, this morning as we've, um, we've understood that you have called us to a, a bigger purpose. You've called us to, um, God, something that is bigger than existing. Something that is bigger than um, just going through normal life and um, just eating our food and sleeping and getting up for work. God, you've called us to something so much bigger and so much greater. Thank you that you have transformed our lives to understand that, Lord, you want to do something awesome and amazing in us and through us. That there's a call of God on every one of our lives to do something awesome and amazing for you. Lord, you're calling us to make an impact on the world. You're calling us to, to be a change agent to be somebody who would point someone to Jesus, to be those that would love others. And so we're asking God that in the next seven weeks as we're working through this book and as we're working through these messages and as we're, we're seeking your face for what it looks like to be transformed, that God, you would open our hearts and our minds, that you would challenge us. Maybe even for the first time in our lives, we're saying, God, challenge me. Challenge me in my spirit, challenge me in my heart, challenge me in my mind to, to grow, to be more and more like you. Lord, I'm, I'm asking you to transform my life. There's stuff in my life that, that needs work. There's things that, that God, I, I'm struggling with and I need you to, to transform them. And so would you, over the just, God, next half hour or so, would you work in our hearts and our minds? Would you set our faces towards you, our eyes, our hearts, our minds, set towards what you want to say and what you want to do? God, would you use these, these next moments that Pastor Chris comes and he shares with us today, would you use these moments to, God, to change the way we think, to change the way that we act, change the way that we behave? God, we want to be more like you. And so we thank you, Jesus, for, for calling us to something bigger than existence. Thank you that we get to represent you, that you want to do something awesome in our lives. And so we just give you this next period of time, Lord. We, 
we thank you for the opportunity to grow and to learn. That you don't leave us where we are, but you're working on us. And so we thank you for that awesome privilege. Thank you for the beautiful music this morning. Thank you for the pleasure that it is to lift up the awesome, incredible name of Jesus. God, I thank you that, that when you were having a conversation with your disciples and they were confused about how they were to pray, that you taught them. and You showed them the words that they should say when they pray. And so we want to say those words together this morning, God. We want to praise you and pray the way you taught us to pray and the way you taught the disciples to pray, saying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, Dad. It's me. Man, I know it's been a long time since we talked. I was, you know, I was kind of hoping you'd answer, but um, yeah, I understand that you probably don't want to talk to me. I've just gone so far, and the things I've done, I, I just regret it, you know. And I know how bad I've hurt you and let you down, but. But Dad, I, I miss you. I miss how we drive around and just talk about life. And I just, I just want to come home. But I know you've probably written me off. I can't blame you, actually. Here's, here's, here's the thing. It's kind of a shot in the dark, but I'm, uh, I'm coming through town soon, and, and I'd really just like to see you. I know I can't just show up at the front door like I used to, but, but if you want to see me, just hang a small sheet out on the porch. And if the sheet isn't there, when I drive by, I'll keep going, and, and I'll try not to bother you anymore. I love you, Dad.
I want to want to thank Tom. I'm going to kill him later, but I, I thank him. <laughs> I thank you for your expressions of uh, of appreciation. Um, you know how sometimes people will say something, and for them, it's kind of a throwaway comment, but it goes straight into who we are, and, and we never forget it. Anybody have sayings like that? I, I remember in seminary there was a pa- uh, one of the the professors I had. His name was David Siemens. And he said in um, one of those early classes, he said, your job as a pastor is to comfort the discomforted and discomfort the comforted. Think about that. We are entering 50 days of transformation. I cannot tell you how excited I am for this, but you need to know right up front, it will not be comfortable for you the whole time. And if you and I are going to change, if there are things within our lives that are going to transform, if we are going to take our next steps in our spiritual growth, some of those are going to be really hard and some of them are going to be uncomfortable. And so I want to encourage you, and just so you know, ahead of time, you know, that, that's what's coming. And, and understand that that's the way that God works. Now, our theme verse for this is Romans 12.2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Say that with me. Let's read it together. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've heard me say the way you think determines the way you feel. The way you feel determines the way you act. And so if you and I want to change the way we're living, if we want to change the way we act, we have to change our thinking. We have to change our our minds. We have to start with what's going on between our ears. The key to our transformation doesn't start with our will. Willpower doesn't work for some of the stuff we have to change. Willpower is part of it, but it has to begin in here where we have to decide, we have to change the way we think, we have to change our perceptions, we have to change our thoughts, we have to change our beliefs, and then our actions will follow. And we're going to look at how do we apply that, that principle of changing our mind to a whole whole bunch of different areas of our lives. Now, God wants to transform us and change us from emptiness to fullness, from uh, defeat and failure to faith and victory. He wants to change our, our lives from feeling insecure and inferior. He wants to fill us instead with courage and with boldness. And it starts with our spiritual health. All the other areas of our life that we're going to look at, we're going to look at our relational life, our our physical life, our, our vocational life, our mental life, our emotional life. It all starts with our spiritual health. Where are we in our spirit, in, in the deepest part of who we are? The reality is, the farther that you get away from God, the farther that I get away from God, the more trouble we are going to have in our lives. The more trials, the more difficulties. When I'm not following God's plan for my life, there's a whole lot more bumps in, in the road. Now, the Bible says that the way of the unrighteous is rough. It's full of thorns. It's difficult. It's a rocky, rocky road. The farther that I get away from where God wants me to be. On the other hand, the closer that I get to God, the more my life is going to be transformed. Yes, my life will never be trouble-free, and neither will yours. As I had a friend many, many years ago, he said, I I was, uh, did you ever go off on a bunch of stuff? You just had one of those days. I had one of those, and I remember Randy said to me, Chris, this ain't heaven. So we will always have trouble. We'll always have problems. We'll always have, have trials. But when we get far away from the path that God has for us, they become far worse. Now, God, the, the scripture is full of, of, of people who have allowed God to transform their lives, and, and they had a huge impact for him. The apostle Paul, you know, when he finally went to see Christ face to face, he was transformed radically. He was literally a religious terrorist. That's who Paul was. He was pursuing Christians. He wanted, he wanted to kill them. And it, God transformed him into the apostle of love. 
Isaiah, if you read in the Old Testament, he was transformed from a person who was, who was depressed into a courageous person. Moses got so close to God, the Bible says, that he was even transformed in his appearance. And after one of his times with God, the people just couldn't look at him. God had changed him so much. Now, you are here this morning for a variety of reasons. And those of you who are watching online, you're watching online for a variety of reasons. But I believe that one of those is because in some way, and you may not use these exact words, but you want to get closer to God than you are. You may be just checking this thing out. You may have just heard from a friend. You may have just, just thought about it, and for some reason you, you're, you're here or you're listening or watching online. Or you may have been a follower of Jesus for decades, and, and you're here because you know he wants to do more with us. See, the Scripture teaches that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned into our own way. You see, we are like sheep, and we tend to wander. You don't have to teach a sheep to wander away. Have you ever noticed that? For those of you who understand that a little bit, that's why we have fences, okay? They can just go and get themselves into all kinds of trouble. It is their very nature to wander away. They're... Um, my mom and dad used to have a couple hundred of them, and they are not real smart. And so you and I, got, the scripture says we're sort of like those sheep. We can wander off spiritually, and the truth is sometimes, maybe this has happened in your life, you, you turn around and all of a sudden you wonder, how did I get here? I never expected to get this far away from God. And what happens is you didn't get there in one big leap. It's just as you and I began to conform and nibble in the world, and then we wander farther and farther and farther away. So if I want to get closer to God, we're going to talk about today, how do we do that? What's necessary for me to take my next step? What's necessary for me to change? What has to happen so that I can, uh, can either get close to God, or, or how do I stay close, or how do I get back? To where I used to be. You know, some of you will say, I know I'm not where I used to be, but I can remember a time. I can remember a time when, when I was so close, when I could sense God's presence with me, that it seemed like every message was speaking to my heart, when every single song would lift, would lift my heart, when, when I, the sunshine was bright. You can remember those times. If you want to get back, even if you've kind of lost the spark, this is how we get back there. Now, fortunately, we have a story in the Bible of how to get back to God and how to get close to our, our Heavenly Father. It's a story of the prodigal son, and sometimes it's called the, pro, the story of the prodigal sons because there's an elder son, but we're not going to focus on that this morning. But really, that parable is all about the loving father. It really should be more rightly called the parable of the loving father. The story is in Luke chapter 15. Uh, let, me, let me read it, and then we're going to pull some principles out of that of how you and I can get close to God. Jesus told this story. He said, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, give me my share of your estate now instead of waiting until you die. So his father divided his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed all his belongings and he left home to live in a distant land. There he squandered the gift that he'd been given and wasted his life and money on wild parties and reckless living. About the time all his money ran out, a severe famine hit the land and he began to starve because he was left with nothing. The only job he could find was feeding swine on a farm. He became so desperate and hungry that even the pig slop he was feeding the swine looked good to him, but no one would give him anything for his hunger. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, this is crazy. At my father's house, even the lowest paid workers eat well while I'm far away dying of hunger. I'm going to return home to my father and humbly say, Father, I've sinned against both God and you. I'm not worthy to be part of this family or to be called your son, but please just make me one of your servants who works for you. 
With that attitude, he headed back to his father. But while the son was a long distance away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he went out to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've seen both God and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring me the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Then get my signet ring for his, for his finger and shoes for his feet. Then roast the calf that we have been fattening. We're going to celebrate with a feast of eating and drinking for this child of mine who is distant and dead, but now he's back and alive. He was lost, but now he's found, so let the party begin. <laughs> I love that. You know, I, lo- I, just, I just love that. What an incredible story about the love of our father. That as you and I have wandered away from the, our, the creator who made us, the father and the God who, who loves us, this is how he receives us as we come back. You know, it's just God, uh, the, the kid, you know the story, you remember, he goes to his father and he says, I want you to give me what is mine. Notice it's a very self-centered life. Give me. Give me mine. I want mine now. And by the way, Dad, I'm in a hurry. I can't even wait for you to die. Just give it to me now. You know you're going to when you die, so just give give it to me now. Uh, And and so our culture is consumed by I want it now, right? And if I, I want it now, and if I can't pay for it, I'll get it on credit, and so, and so we strain ourselves out, and many people are head over heels in debt just because they want me, mine, now. That's what the kid did. So he takes off. He goes to, is there, was there Las Vegas in Jerusalem? I, you know, I, I don't know, but that's where he is, you know, and he says he wasted it all, you know, and, and you can fill in the blanks. Whatever happened 2,000 years ago, the more things change, the more they stay the same, okay? They had the same issues back then, just with a different coat. And so the kid, he wastes it all. He hits the skids. And at the same time, things go to bad to worse. There's a famine in the land. He can't find a job. And then he has to take what is the worst job for a Jew. They weren't even supposed to touch the pigs, right? And so now he, here he is the one, he has to live with them. He has to feed them, and he gets so far down, he looks at the slop that they're giving the pigs, and he he gets hungry to eat that. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Transformed. You see, the farther we get away from God, the better things that are not of God look to us. And so he finally says, you know, he's hungry, he's desperate, and he says, you know, I think about the people that are the worst, the lowest paid in my father's, you know, are, are better off than this. So I'll go back and I'll just have him forget that I'm one of his sons and, and I'll, just, uh, I'll just ask to go to work for him. Even though he'd wasted his life, he'd wasted everything that his father had given to him, he said, you know, I'd rather be a servant in his house than die out here in this distant country. And then we see the father's response. Just running to greet him. I love the video. Uh, Tom found that this week. And just the, the video of that father. And, and sometimes I think we are afraid to come back to God because of how, how, God, how God will get us. How God will treat us when we come back to him. But we see the, the reaction of, of the father. Now, you know, <clears throat> this morning, I don't know where you are. You may be a long, long ways away from God. And I'm not talking about you. You could be sitting in this pew and you could have wandered a long, long ways away from God. And so today may be the day for you to start back. And how do we start back? The first thing that has to happen is you and I, we have to get fed up with our life. We have to get fed up. We have to say, that's it. 
that's enough. We have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. We have to say, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm, I'm stressed. I'm lonely. I'm depressed. I'm overworked. I'm too busy. I don't even like myself, and I don't like what I'm becoming. I don't like the attitudes that I'm having. You and I have to, you see, nothing is going to happen in your life or my life until we first get dissatisfied with the way we are. As long as we are comfortable with where we are in our spiritual journey, we will never take that next step. That's why David Seaman says that part of my job is to discomfort the comforted. In other words, we can't stop. There is no such thing as neutral in our spiritual growth. You do not tread water. You're either going forward or you're sinking. And so you and I, to change, we have to get fed up with our life. You see, the reality is we don't change until the pain of change becomes less than the pain of staying where we are. We have to get desperate. We have to get really hungry. We have to be anxious for a change. Nothing happens until we get fed up. It said he wasted it all. He had nothing left. He got desperate. He got hungry. And he finally came to his senses. Are you there yet? <laughs> if not, I will continue to pray that the Holy Spirit will pursue you that he will make you uncomfortable, that he'll, he'll call you back. Because you see, there are some times in our lives that God allows a little rain. God allows that trouble to come into our lives. I think sometimes God sometimes says to me, you know, okay, Chris, that's not the way I believe you should live, but okay, you go ahead. And I think sometimes God lets us run faith, full force into the consequences of our poor choices. Where God says, okay, you're not going to do it my way. You're going to do it your way. Okay, Chris, this is the way it's going to go. And this is what's going to happen. And sometimes until that pain gets bad enough, you and I will keep following that. We'll keep following that way. You've heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Right? Everybody heard that? There's a, the second half of that says, but you can salt his oats and make him thirsty. <laughs> I think that's what God does sometimes in letting you and I go full force into the consequences of our sin. And then he begins to call us back. The reality is then God is knocking at our door. Jeremiah 29 says this. God is speaking. He says, you'll find me when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. We have dumbed down what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we have said that all it means, by basically, is sitting in a pew on Sunday morning and letting everybody else do what they want to do, and we'll do what we want to do. Folks, that is not everything that's involved in being a disciple of Jesus. It's not a casual thing. It's about all of our lives. It's not a hobby. So the first step back is to get fed up. Second... I have to own up to my sin. I have to own up to my sin. When he came to his senses, it said. In other words, he said, I can't keep doing this. You know, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. God, to live without God is insane. And here's a step back. In Luke 15, he's, in verse 17, he said, I have sinned against God and against you. Nothing's going to happen until you and I get fed up, and then we have to own up to our sin. We have to accept our responsibility. You know, we may have be saying, God, I've been doing something that I think is best, but you know, I'm done following the way I think is best, and I'm going to follow the way that you think is best. Isaiah 59 says this, Your sins have separated you from your God and have hidden his face from you. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when it's felt like my prayers were just sort of bouncing off the ceiling. Anybody been there? It seemed like God was not hearing me. And then I realized, I began to look at my life, that sometimes it was because of my sin had put that ceiling there. That my sin had caused a separation from, from my God. And so you and I, we have to get fed up. Then we have to own up. We have to take our responsibility in the whole thing. There's an old saying, it's so true, if you feel far from God, guess who moved? God hasn't moved. 
His hand is still reaching toward you and toward me. He has never not been there. And you and I have moved away when we give our love to someone else. Instead of loving God, we love things in the world more than we love God. And the Bible talks about we make idols. And idols are not just those things carved out of wooden stone. Your idol can look like your car. Your idol could be your job, could be your career. Your idol could be another person. Your idol could be the way you look and your physical appearance. Anything that comes before our love for God can become an idol. And you remember the first commandments that God said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make false idols. Because you see, all of those, they fall apart. Money can be an idol. Success. Golf can be an idol. Um, you know, the temple of the ninth hole. Okay? Yeah, I, I know guys, they're, they're more committed to their foursome on Sunday morning than they are to their wives and their families and their God. The Steelers can be an idol. Now, none of those things are bad things. They just make lousy gods. And we have to place him in first. You see, the, the reality is you're as close to God as you choose to be. Our culture would say for every problem in our lives, we need to look back and find who else caused it or whose fault that it was. The truth is, you're as close to God as you want to be. And you say, well, you know, I'd be closer to God if my husband this or if my wife that. Really? No, you choose where you are in your spiritual journey. You choose it. You determine it. We can't blame your mom, your dad, your brother. You can't even blame the government for this. There's a whole lot we can blame the government for, right? But you can't blame him for where you are in your spiritual journey. It's up to you. You're as close to God as you choose to be. And very often, you and I don't take those steps because we're not desperate. Do you ever play around in a pool as a kid? And you're doing all kinds of stuff as a kid. And then and something possesses one of the people playing. And, and they sort of start to hold the one kid under the water. Maybe you've been the one who has held underwater. It's okay for a few seconds, right? And you want them to get off you, and then they don't, and they don't. And then they hold you down too long, and what do you do? Then we get desperate, right? And we fight for it. When are you going to fight for getting closer to God? When are you going to grab that hunger that he has placed within you? There's a place that nothing else can fill. We own up to our sin. The Lord says in Isaiah... No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Sometimes we think we've gone too far, and God says, no, you haven't. And he wants to clean that out. And that sin that often in our lives has started so small, it begins to spread like a cancer. And it's better for you and I to nip it in the bud and stop it right where it is. 2 Corinthians 5 says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's what Jesus wants to do in you and in me. He says in 2 Corinthians 13, test yourself to make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups if you fail the test. Do something about it. There's a passage in our outline that talks about you and I testing ourselves. It's in Psalm 139, and you can read it on your own later. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way, of, in the way everlasting. So I need to get fed up. I need to own up to my part in it. And third, I need to offer up myself. You want to come back to God, you have to offer yourselves to him. Offer your life. Offer yourself. Offer your total being. That's the third thing that this son did. He, gave, he went back with everything he had. Had he messed it up? Oh, yeah. But the father received him. He comes back and he returned to the father. He said, Make me a servant. Remember when he first left, he said, give me. And now what's he saying? Make me. See the difference in stance? 
The first was self-centered. The, the second is other-centered, and it is centered on God. He, there's a change in his attitude. He leaves. He says, gimme, 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 gimme. When he comes back, he says to the Father, make me. And that's transformation. He moves from self-centeredness to being God-centered. Are you letting God be the center? Are you letting God form you and make you and mold you and transform you? Or are you conforming to how the world says that you should live? Now, realize transformation doesn't happen overnight. Many things in our lives, you and I have taken years to mess them up and don't expect God to fix them just like that. Transformation sometimes is a multiple step process, but there is a decision that starts it. 2 Corinthians 3 says, We reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord. Now, that word transformed, there's a word, uh, it, it, the New Testament was written in Greek, and there's a Greek word for transformed. It's Metamorpho, metamorpho. Say it with me. You know, and you know Greek. We get the English word metamorphosis. Yeah, yeah. And so, so we understand that a, a little bit. It's sort of like when a butterfly comes from a caterpillar to a pupa to a chrysalis, and the pupa or chrysalis into a butterfly. That's metamorphosis. We have some friends, Roger and Loretta. They actually planted in their backyard milkweed and, and something else. I, they, they told me what the plant was so that the, the so that the caterpillars or whatever would come in their place, and we were over visiting, and they showed us the, 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 the cocoon and stuff that they were making. And then Roger told me last week they sat there and they watched one come out. The change from the ugly caterpillar to the beautiful, beautiful butterfly. You see, that's what God wants to do in you and me. He wants to take the ugliness of our lives and the way that we have messed it up as we have been so self-centered. And God says, you come to me, and, and if we make our lives God-centered, God says, I, I, I will do amazing things. Caterpillars, are, 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 they're confined to where they are, and all they do is munch leaves. <laughs> and butterfly, they, they just go. And what God wants you and me to be is like a butterfly transformed and propelled by the power and the wind of the Holy Spirit. The prodigal son said, make me. Our vision is that we will make mature, mobilize, and multiply disciples. That's what God wants us to do. Romans 12, 2, you know, that's our theme verse. But there's a verse that comes before that. Look what it says. Because God is merciful to you, offer yourselves. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Then Paul writes, and do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, there's no real transformation until we offer ourselves up. And then we see the Father's response Verse 20 and 22, filled with love and compassion, he ran out to his son, he threw his arms around him, he blessed him. He said, bring the best, bring the best, you know, the best shoes, the best robe, the signet ring. That's sort of like the father giving him the American Express, giving him back the checkbook. Are you kidding me? Just wasted half. He restored him to proper relationship. You see, God doesn't hold a grudge at you for all the dumb stuff you've done. God doesn't do that. God has a better plan for your life than you could ever imagine. Did, do you remember baby food? You remember baby food? Some of us, oh, that's, not, that's terrible. You know, I've fed babies and it, it, it's just it's terribly tasty. But, but babies eat that stuff up, don't they? You and I as adults, we know there's something better coming right? There's hamburgers and honey nut Cheerios and T-bone steaks and Dairy Queen Blizzard, you know, all that great stuff. God has incredible meals waiting for you and for me spiritually if we'll move beyond the baby stuff. You see, if you and I knew there was a better way, wouldn't we live it? 
That's what God wants for us. So what do we do? Fourth, the last thing we do is we lift up our praise. We lift up our praise. Where we say, God, I just want to thank you. You know, we got to get fed up with where we are. We have to own up to, you know, to our part. And, and we have to allow ourselves to be changed. And then uh, in Luke 15, verse 23, the Father says, we're going to celebrate with a feast. He was lost, but now he's found. <laughs> Let me just give you a quick thing that will help with your transformation. Singing. Now, I know, I, I've heard some of you sing. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, you, uh, you have a voice that should be cultivated, <laughs> should be plowed under. No, no okay. Yeah. Uh, see, the Bible says to make a joyful noise. It does not say it always has to be on key. You want to see God transform your life as you see something that you're grateful for? Sing. Sing. Psychologists say it's, it's good for us. Uh, I heard of a psychologist that someone who came to hit, see him for, for depression. Uh, he'd find out that the person was a, you know, went to church and he'd say, did you, sing, did you sing all the songs? No. He sent the guy back to sing all the songs. It's amazing what singing will do, the habit. And, and it's sort of like group therapy as we sing together and as we lift our, lift our praises to God. There's a great book, and, and I, I've not read it. I've just heard references to it, what's called Imperfect Harmony, Finding Happiness in Singing with Others. We give God praise for all that he has done and all that he will do. And the father celebrated. And he had a celebration. You see, that's what he'll do as you take your next step. God the father will be down there and he'll say, oh, that's good. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, you can do it. And he'll be encouraging us. And as we are transformed from, our in, from the inside out, God will welcome us into the life that he's planning for us. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are just amazed at your grace, <laughs> at the way, you know, the, the Father accepted that Son and the way, God, that you accept us. There's no way that we deserve that, but we're so, so very, very grateful. God, I pray for each person here, and I, I ask that you will make us uncomfortable with where we are. And build within us a hunger and a desire to, to know you more. God, we've loved some other things more than we have loved you. Would you take the veil away from our eyes and allow us to see that and, and allow us to and help us to get our priorities back to where they need to be? Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for your gift of salvation for loving us and dying on the cross, and God, for, for all that you have given to us, we, we give ourselves back to you, and we ask you to make us into who you want us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
as you go, go knowing that God's not done with you yet, that there are still things he wants you to know and grow and experience. And he doesn't do that for himself. He does it for you. So go and may God build within you the courage to take the next step, whatever that is, and become that butterfly he wants you to be. In God's holy and precious name, go and live and love with the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen. Amen.